Okay, welcome back everyone. It's great to have you here. And welcome back to the people that are watching us on live stream. Welcome back to the second part of this day. Thank you so much for staying with us and uh, for being such a great audience. So this afternoon, we're going to deal with complex systems and long-term attitudes. But before we go ahead and do it, I would like to introduce to you two more people that have been instrumental. One is Azura Muzonigro. Just raise your hand. She's also part of the curatorial team. Yay. And um, Laura, are you here? Maybe Laura is not. Laura went with Sigil to tour the, the building because Khaled this morning didn't no, say it. But there, oh, ha, Laura, yeah, Laura, show yourself. Yeah, the other part of the curatorial team. That's great. And so she's going to take Sigil. Khaled is, uh, and uh, and his team and his collective are going to be one of the commissions for the 22nd Triennale. Uh, so welcome back. This afternoon we're going to discuss complex systems. And uh, the person that will discuss complex systems with you is Adam Bly. Adam Bly is a dear friend and a great partner in crime, as are other people that you have met during the day and that you will meet. But Adam and I go back to more than 10 years ago, but our first collaboration together was Designing the Elastic Mind 10 years ago. It was an exhibition about design and science. And in fact, Adam starts out as a scientist, but has quickly become a science passionario, a science activist of sorts. He's really been struggling and striving and desiring for his whole career to make science become part of life and to elevate design literacy all over the world. He has done so by starting, first of all, a, a, a wonderful science magazine called Seed that was stunning because not only was it serious science, it was a great looking magazine. And this goes to what we were saying before. Formal elegance is a, a, a form of respect towards other human beings. He then went on to work with the UN and many big organizations, some private clients. Then he sold his company to Spotify and he was chief scientist for Spotify for quite a few years. And recently, he left Spotify and started a new company that is about complex systems. It's about helping the world uh, deal with the uh, systemic thought. So he will be the one introducing the panel on complex systems with an introduction beforehand. But before he um, speaks, I will give you two more of those snippet videos, one by Justinian Trebillon from the Migrant Journal, and the second from Oliver Morton from The Economist. So please, let's cue on the videos, and then Adam will waltz on stage. And off we go. What did I do? Huh? What did I say? Dominique Chen and... Oh, I'm so sorry. I made a mistake. Is Justinian Trebillon? from the Migrant Journal, and Dominique Chen, who is an academic from, from Tokyo. Really interesting videos. So here they come, and then Adam Bly. Don't oh, worry. It's all right. It's all right. Hello, I'm Justinien Tribillon, the editor of Migrant Journal. What we really try to do with Migrant Journal, with the project we started in October 2016, is to go back to the roots of that concept of migration and uh, explore it with a fresh eye. So not only looking at the circulation of people, but also ideas, goods, cultures, uh, even birds and seeds, uh, in order to reclaim that concept, go back to the root of it, uh, and explore that concept with a fresh eye. And. Um, it's of course for us really important uh, to demonstrate and to explore the interconnectedness of migration today and how you cannot disconnect the migration of people from the migration of goods and if I want also to make differences between people, the migration of tourists for instance against uh, migration of uh, people for economic purpose. So, and the reason why we wanted to do this is because we think by looking at the current political scene at uh, discourses such as Brexit uh, in the UK or the rise of uh, the election of Donald Trump in the US, that actually this aspect of migration has been uh, forgotten today and that for the majority of people, the majority of citizens and voters, uh, the interconnected of migration, the way that this all comes together, the way that movement and circulation is intrinsic to our way of life has been forgotten.
The connection between media industry and fermentation culture is of course not an obvious one, but I think it's a connection that our society needs to change for the better, and that change mainly concerns our perception of time. Because we know that media technologies have focused on this very short-term attention span of human beings, whereas artisans working for the fermented food industry all over the world they all have been inheriting the productions beyond generations, often more than 100 years. What is interesting is the way they treat bacteria seems to be more humane than the way media technology treats its human users. Artisans try to create the best environment for the bacteria to thrive for a very long time period while trying to communicate with them in a scientific manner. On the other hand, We've all came to know that our advertisement technology and social networks have focused on how to control its user's psychology to induce more views and clicks, which is causing serious damage to our mental autonomy. But we have to remember that technology itself is value neutral, so the question really is how we can make use of technologies to invoke a longer term thinking in ourselves so that we can restore the broken nature of human beings. And for that, I think computer science and digital culture can learn a lot from the way fermentation culture has dealt with this very complex world of micro-living organisms. Yeah, I like going to um, Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Paula, for, for the invitation to the three and for the invitation. Um, so we're going to talk about complex systems. And what I'm going to try to do in just a few minutes is um, kind of give you a, a, a broad overview of, of what we mean when we say complex systems, when we talk about complexity, really to tee up the conversation that we'll have following that. So um, three things that sort of touch on. Uh, first and foremost, what is this when we say complexity? Um, we often confuse a complex system in colloquial terms with a complicated system or things that are hard to solve in the world. But really complexity is its own science and has its own mathematical underpinning. So useful to just touch on that a little bit. The second is why are we talking about this now? Why is this part of a theme for Triennale? Why are we having a, a symposium with a track focused on complexity? So sort of frame this in terms of the present moment and why I think it's incredibly important for us to be having this discussion. And then thirdly, how are designers and how can designers um, enact systems thinking and counter complexity or reflect complexity perhaps uh, in their work, in their interventions, and, and hopefully be fodder for uh, some of the thinking going into to the Triennale. So first and foremost, what are, we, what are we talking about here? What is a complex system? So a complex system is really nothing more than uh, a system of many different components, many of them interacting with one another. So not necessarily that they're all interacting with one another, but you can see a multitude of interactions, and oftentimes, we reflect this, we, we visualize complex systems as networks. They provide a sort of convenient uh, visual language as well as a mathematical underpinning in graphs and graph theory that allows us to understand how things relate to one another. So some of the features of complex systems that are important for us to think about, um, so sort of hallmark features, not apparent in all complex systems, but many of them um, uh, critical features for us to characterize something as complex. So the first is, is non-linearity. So if you think about something that's linear, then we can look at a sort of one-to-one -one relationship between some input, some output. We can expect some expected consequences based on the structure of the network of what we put in and what we come out. Non-linearity, uh, often sort of characterized in terms of butterfly effects, really means that the structure of a network or the structure of a complex system means that what we input into it um, might be very, very, very different uh, than the output that comes out at the other end of, of some action or some intervention. Um, and so a very small perturbation, a very small change, a very small input, as is classical in, in a butterfly effect, can have enormous consequences uh, in ways that we, we simply couldn't imagine. And that simply couldn't way we couldn't imagine reflects emergence. So emergence is another property uh, of complex systems where 
the sum is effectively greater than each of these parts uh, individually. Um, and what we're finding, what we can see in a complex system is, is attributes or phenomena or events that happen that are simply unanticipated. We can't imagine how they might come out uh, through simply the sum of the interactions. If we were to just model how each of these pairs worked together, we couldn't anticipate the kind of emergent qualities or output from that system. So there's an element of kind of unintended or surprise consequences that are the result of emergence. The third is that some systems, some complex systems uh, are adaptive, so we call them complex adaptive systems. And these are the systems that we're most familiar with, so financial markets and the immune system and so forth. Our systems, because of feedback loops, they are constantly learning from their environment. Uh, new input serves as new signal, and the network is adapting and responding, and so they're constantly changing over time. So you can imagine that that creates extra challenge when we're trying to model how best to understand or intervene into a complex system or solve for a complex system. So some of the things to think about when we're gonna talk about complex systems are right, nonlinearity, emergence, and these kind of adaptation properties. So let's kind of zoom out now from kind of the math and science to how we see this in the world. Complexity is uh, unquestionably evident uh, all around us in the world today. Um, so it's present in uh, how we understand the body. Uh, so increasingly through uh, genetics, uh, we're able to understand the variety of gene-to-gene -gene interactions, uh, gene-to-disease interactions, chemical-to-disease interactions uh, that really make up the human body. And the more we understand that complexity, the more we can think about modeling drug interactions or new ways of thinking about disease in very, very, very different ways. But we now understand the body in a far more complex sense than we uh, did just years ago. The same is true for the environment. We, we uh, have you know, long understood ecosystems uh, and ecology as a reflection of the complexity of the underlying system. But now we have tools or frameworks like this one. So this is planetary boundaries framework um, that was first introduced about a decade ago uh, from the Stockholm Resilience Center and updated in the last few years, that really starts to posit how a variety of different facets of the environment from ocean acidification to CO2 uh, and furthermore, um, come together and ultimately form one set of equations or one sort of uh, dynamic that needs to be kept in balance in order for us to maintain the planet uh, at the state that we want to keep it at. This was a framework that very much informed recent COP thinking, the Paris Agreement, and so forth. The same thing is obviously true on the heels of um, 2008 and how we saw the interconnectedness of financial markets, uh, how uh, fluctuations in a commodity price in one country gave rise to mortgage crises uh, elsewhere in the world. We saw the banks being highly interconnected. And so today, unquestionably, our economy is a complex system. So health is a complex system. Our environment is a complex system. Uh, our economy is a complex system, so it's, it's I think, unquestionable then to, to say that complexity is a, is a defining attribute of our time. And not only is it sort of the state of society, uh, or the state of the world, it's actually having profound implications on some of the most significant crises and issues in the world. This is a, an example that uh, a team at the New England Complex Systems Institute was, was involved in uncovering over the last few years. And so it looks at the onset of the Arab Spring, so first precipitated by the, the violent unrest in, in Tunisia, and it looks at what are the, some of the factors that we could uh, tease out that gave rise to that political instability. Um, and so if you go kind of one node upstream from the political instability from the, the violence uh, in Tunisia, from the protests in Tunisia, um, we can see this very strong relationship, this strong relationship between food prices and previous political instability or sort of unrest in society. And that's in fact what we saw in Tunisia was a sharp uh, uh, rise in food prices in the period right ahead of that uh, political instability. That was driven in that particular case by a uh, sharp rise in corn prices in the world, um, which was driven by a sharp decline in corn yield in the world, the amount of corn uh, in the world. That was driven by a decline in the United States in the corn output, which was driven by drought, specifically in the Midwest of the United States. And so we can see how something um, very distant geographically and very distant in terms of 
topics uh, in the world gave rise to something um, quite profound that, that transformed uh, the modern era, really. And so what's driving this rise in complexity? Is it, has it always been complex? Um, and certainly complexity is not a new phenomenon. We can't say that the world is suddenly complex. But we could argue that complexity is rising and there are certain curves that we might want to pay attention to if we were to try to anticipate how complexity might change, increase, decrease, adapt in the coming years. These are driven by forces of globalization, connecting countries to one another, trade, uh, connecting things and commodities in new ways, by information technology, certainly by climate change that we saw the example of having profound implications on disease, on uh, any number of factors, on, on financial markets, on mobility and migration, and of course by sharp rises in, in population, continuing rises in population. And of course, to add to the complexity, not only are the drivers driving complexity, they themselves form a complex system. And so we see that climate change and globalization are affected by one another, affecting population, and so on and so forth. This is in addition to um, this sort of state of the world being driven to be more complex, we now have the ability to observe and model that complexity in profound new ways. The first um, is the function of data. And so over the last few years, the rise of data, of open data in particular, has given us the tools, right, to model complexity in ways that we simply weren't able to five years ago, 10 years ago. So now we can actually model, simulate, perhaps even intervene in real time in complex systems, and we have advanced the science. Um, so over the last decade or two, we've seen the rise of um, mathematical frameworks, frameworks borrowed from physics and elsewhere, uh, to give us an understanding of complex systems and of networks so that we can actually model these things and understand them better. All of this is happening quite critically, though, against the backdrop of rising fragmentation in the world. So if you think about it, a rise in complexity is already a profound shift that we need to be mindful of, and it will take the world and its attention and resources to think about complexity and tackle complexity. But this is happening against the backdrop of yet another challenge that makes complexity even more challenging, and that's fragmentation. So as we see around the world, whether in response to Trump or Brexit, this is a discussion of Chavez in Venezuela, we can see rising polarity, rising fragmentation around the world, especially politically, so when you're trying to organize the world to tackle an increasingly interdependent and interconnected state, the fact that society is moving in the other direction and becoming more polarized and fragmented is unbelievably problematic. And so somehow we need to think about fragmentation in the context of rising complexity. To solve for complexity means we either need to be attentive to fragmentation or directly solve for, for fragmentation. So I would argue that this is an era-defining, uh, if not existential, challenge for humankind. It's so important that uh, I think it, it requires our collective attention, collective focus. Uh, it's what I'll be focusing on for the decades to come personally. We've been here before, and I just want to briefly touch on this because we should be optimistic, I think, about our ability to tackle a moment like this, to confront a moment like this. In the 1960s, um, Stuart Brand and Bucky Fuller and McLuhan and a bunch of other great thinkers um, came together and started a movement on campuses in California, Berkeley and elsewhere to, and they distributed these pins called, why haven't, they said, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole earth yet? And really motivated by their observation that the public's lack of comprehension and empathy for the fragility of the planet made it impossible to mot motivate society or government to respond to that fragility. And the movement started in California, spread around the country, and eventually NASA heard the cry and um, produced Earthrise in the late 1960s. And this single image and the context surrounding it for sure galvanized an entire environmental movement, um, gave rise to Earth Day, um, some of the most profoundly important clean air and clean water acts, agencies dedicated to the environment, and we can, of course, have plenty of discussion about sort of the erosion of some of these systems of government, particularly the United States. But change happened. Things happened, and uh, you could argue that the world responded to that fragility at least uh, in an effective way for a couple of decades. Um, and so we were able to produce a single galvanizing intervention 
that brought fragility into the minds and hearts of citizens around the world and led to political action. And so I think that is our challenge now for complexity. Um, and so to me, the, the challenge I would put forward to the design community is one to translate complexity to human scale. These are profoundly difficult concepts to understand. Each individually is a profoundly difficult concept to understand when you're thinking about complex systems and trying to educate and galvanize the public behind them. But complex systems becomes even more important to think about as a, uh, as, as, as a literacy that we need today. And the second is to account for complexity in any of the societal interventions that we put forward in the world to solve for some of the big issues that we're facing. So I don't have time to take you through a bunch of these examples, but I will just, in, in 30 seconds, kind of give you some visual kind of cues uh, to think about some projects, and we'll, we'll go into the panel. Um, so uh, there's two people I have to cite if I'm going to have a conversation about complex systems in this setting. One is, is of course, Buckminster Fuller, and the other will be E.O. Wilson. Um, many of you are familiar with this, with, this, um, with this language, with this quote, and this thinking. Um, but you know, if you go back uh, to some of um, Fuller's work, and you see that in, in, uh, in, in World Game, you can start to see um, examples of you know, what a man needs per day, and the US in the context of the world, and it starts to posit that we need to introduce these constraints as we contemplate systemic solutions to world problems. Visualization has been a, a very useful tool in galvanizing public attention for complexity. Um, I don't think that visualizing a complex system is a solution to complex systems, right? But visualizing complex systems over the last few years because of data visualization, I think has laid a kind of substrate, I would argue, for us to now be a little bit more kind of visually cued to the complexity of the systems around us. And that may be a useful substrate to now actually take more substantial action. I'll skip that. This is a project um, I was sort of want to cite from E.O. Wilson. This is an effort to preserve half the landmass of the world for biodiversity, and the way that, that Wilson, who's really one of the, Paula mentioned him um, uh, earlier, um, one, of the, one of the sort of godfathers of, of consilience thinking, of systems thinking, um, he's starting to think about what are the areas in the world that would be best uh, 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 set up for preserving biodiversity, and has sort of thought about this in a true complex system based on the richness of species that are already in place in that particular environment based on the rarity of those species, so if we're trying to protect half the species, half the biodiversity in the planet, then the rarity of those species is an important feature. The state of conservation in that part of the world, on that land, and the pressures politically or economically on using that land. So it's an example of trying to advocate for something unbelievably important to the sustainability of the planet, but devising a systemic approach to do so. This is a very different scale project um, called Musical Swings from Daily Tous les Jours in Montreal. And this is an example of trying to galvanize an appreciation. These are swings where if you swing on them individually, it produces a note. And if multiple people in the city swing on them together, it produces this incredible melody, this incredible harmony. And I think this is a, an interesting kind of cognitive shift that we need to compel as we start to think about systems against the context of fragmentation, is how do we actually invite a greater sensitivity to the need for collaboration, for cooperation in cities, in other environments, um, from different disciplines. And, and sometimes I can, think, I can imagine interventions like this being very effective in doing that. This is a project to reimagine currency based on the value of that currency with respect to the resource depletion that's required to execute sort of that thing that you're consuming with the currency. So how do you actually reflect the resource depletion, um, the effect on an ecosystem uh, as part of the actual dynamic value of a currency as opposed to a fixed price of the currency uh, that today is obviously not fixed to resource usage. So I'll leave it there uh, and we can sort of touch on some of these topics. I'm gonna briefly introduce the panelists and invite Michael John F. up after that. So uh, our speakers are, um, so Michael John Gorman, Koyo Kuyo, and Marina Otrero verzier um, Michael John Gorman uh, is founding director of Biotopia, so a new museum in Munich, uh, combining life sciences, art, and design. 
Uh, Koyo is the founding artistic director of Raw Material Company and is contributing Dig Where You Stand for Carnegie's 57th edition of Carnegie International. Uh, and Marina is an architect based in Rotterdam, director of research at the Het Nuye Institute uh, and curator of work, body, leisure at the Dutch Pavilion uh, at the Venice Biennale. Um, so I'll turn it over to Michael John, invite him up, uh, and we'll have a panel discussion after that. Thanks. Good. Hello. Um, so I have a question for you. What does nature really look like? Um, we've heard a lot about nature today, but if you had a picture of nature, what would that be? Um, many of you may think of David Attenborough, nature documentaries, uh, mammals with uh, uh, big eyes. Uh, uh, you may think of um, uh, romantic images of nature. But as of just one month ago, we have a new picture of nature. And I'm just going to show you that now. So this was published in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences just last month. And it's a picture of nature which actually, uh, following on Adam's uh, presentation, would have appealed to Buckminster Fuller because it's a picture of nature by weight, by mass. Uh, um, it's uh, the biomass, um, um, so the mass in terms of gigatons of carbon of all living organisms. So we now know how much all of the living organisms in the world weigh. And it turns out it's 550 gigatons. Um, and what does this picture tell us? So it tells us that mostly it's about the plants, 450 gigatons of carbon of plant material, living plant material. So they're the big story. Uh, then you have bacteria. Um, then uh, archaea, these very primitive organisms, uh, fungi, uh, and uh, protists, and uh, then much smaller, uh, the animals. So it turns out our picture of nature has been completely wrong, our internalized image. Uh, if you blow up the animal section, um, it, turns up that, it turns out that arthropods, so meaning insects, arachnids, uh, segmented like millipedes and centipedes and so and also lobsters crustaceans um, are dominant uh, then you then you have the fish uh, and then uh, if you look down I think the very interesting part of this is uh, this part where you have uh, the l livestock and humans and wild mammals so humans and livestock together make up 95% of all mammal or bird life on land, which is kind of an extraordinary thing. Um, the most common bird in the world is the chicken. There are 25 billion chickens in the world. Um, so the idea that humans aren't completely intertwined uh, with um, at, at least this part of wildlife is, is, is impossible to sustain. Um, so, if we are looking at uh, nature, we have to consider uh, the, the effect of uh, domestication of species. Um, and following from this, what is the greatest single problem we face in the coming decades? Um, Adam is interested in understanding complex systems, um, and that's probably required for the solution. Um, we heard a little bit earlier from Mariana uh, about uh, problems of extinction. Um, this is the Panamanian golden frog. Um, the Panamanian golden frog has pretty much gone extinct in the wild. And why has that happened? Uh, it's happened because of uh, humans transporting uh, a particular kind of fungus through air travel, uh, which has meant that this fungus, uh, fungal infection of these amphibians has spread incredibly quickly throughout the whole planet. Um, and there are other cases where other amphibians have been wiped out uh, uh, or because uh, their sex has changed uh, due to human birth control pills. Um, so we are living in what Neri Oxman has called the age of entanglement. We are inextricably in, uh, entangled with our ecosystems. Um, this has been described by Elizabeth Colbert uh, as the sixth extinction, the sixth mass extinction event. Um, and you see here 
uh, some examples of the, the level of uh, extinction rate of other species. Um, as you saw previously, the, the extinction rate of amphibians alone right now is 25,000 times the background extinction rate, the normal extinction rate, um, which is probably cause for concern. So uh, while there may be other candidates for the question of what is the greatest challenge we face, one could think of uh, certainly climate change, uh, one could think of antibiotic resistant bacteria, plastic in our oceans, um, and uh, several other candidates, even the idea of uh, um, robots uh, taking over our jobs. Uh, nonetheless, I, I hope you will uh, agree that mass extinction, uh, the clue is in the name, is, is something that we should be seriously concerned about. Um, uh, where I'm working now is uh, in, in Germany. Uh, so we recently, in November, uh, had a situation where it was reported that the amount of insects uh, present in Germany had dropped uh, by 76% since 1989 by sheer biomass uh, from a number of uh, observations that were made. So this was uh, a, a huge uh, wake-up call um, and uh, um, has actually led to some changes in legislation pretty quickly. Um, but uh, this, this is just an example uh, uh, of how this is not uh, uh, an issue that is limited to Panama or exotic tropical locations or coral reefs. Um, uh, Elizabeth Colbert uh, puts it uh, poetically, saying that where uh, in the fifth mass extinction was caused by a large meteorite colliding with the Yucatan, uh, with Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, we are the meteorite uh, for the sixth extinction. Funnily enough, People don't really talk about this as much as you would expect. Um, so this is a comparison of um, discussions of biodiversity, uh, which are the green uh, that you can see below, compared with discussions of climate change. So climate change has done a much better job of uh, raising debate, raising awareness, raising discussion uh, than these, uh, these issues around the biodiversity crash. Um, which I think is quite interesting. So there's a need for a new uh, movement, a new awareness uh, around what is going right on, right on right now in terms of mass extinction. How can we solve mass extinction? Well, this is not an easy question um, uh, because it is a very complex problem and not just a complicated problem. Um, this is one approach. Uh, have, uh, so George Church uh, is one example of uh, uh, a number of people who are currently trying to uh, revive extinct species, including the mammoth. Um, George Church claims that by the summer of 2019, he will have a viable mammoth embryo um, incubated in an elephant. Thanks. Um, uh, people are also trying to revive other extinct species, such as the passenger pigeon, the Tasmanian tiger, uh, and more. But by focusing on individual species, one will not address the problem um, because the causes of mass extinction are very different and they relate to points like habitat destruction uh, and uh, also the transformations of the planet caused by humans. A different approach. Well, um, we are developing a new uh, museum center forum uh, in, in Munich focusing on the interface between biodiversity and society and life sciences and society. Um, but one of the, the, the key challenges that we think is, is essential if we are to uh, work on this question of extinctions is the question of empathy. And empathy uh, always in, implies a shift of perspective, uh, seeing the world from a different perspective, and sometimes stepping out of the human perspective on the world. Um, empathy has been very, uh, quite unfashionable for a long time in biology. Uh, uh, people would say this smacks of anthropomorphism. We're projecting human uh, ways of uh, experiencing the world onto animals. Um, but recently, um, people have said, actually, no. Um, Franz Duval and other key biologists and scientists have actually said that you know, animals ex have empathy. Uh, we, uh, there's a whole raft of studies now on animal emotions and animal behavior that are really transforming uh, the way we think about animals. Um, and I think we need to resist the trap of, of uh, 
uh, of people who say that anthropomorph anthropomorphism is, is, is a danger because, uh, in fact, we need to think uh, as um, in books like Other Minds, looking at octopus intelligence, that uh, animals just possess different uh, faculties than we do. But uh, uh, we, if we actually respect them and learn about them, we can, we can actually um, uh, benefit enormously. Um, just very quickly, uh, um, I, as I need to finish very soon, uh, one minute apparently, uh, um, uh, our approach uh, in Biotopia, which is a, a project in development, in design, is to look at the connections between humans and other species through the lens of behavior. So, so we're using beh the behaviors that connect us uh, with other species, from communication uh, to sleep. Why do all animals sleep? People still don't know the answer to that question. Um, to eating, to, to uh, uh, fighting and defending, uh, to reproduction, to movement and migration uh, as behaviors that, that connect us with other species. I won't go into details, um, but I, I suppose our key goal is, is, this, is to reconfigure the relationship between humans and other species. Um, and just to end, um, in addition to all of this n amazing new science around, uh, around animal behavior, which is really opening up uh, vast new realms of our understanding of animals, uh, we are also at a moment when people are really finding out new ways to observe such behavior uh, with instruments such as this um, uh, advanced telemetry systems uh, this is a little backpack on a bee. It's a, it's a, a, a radio transmitter uh, on a bee. Uh, so the ins bees, locusts, uh, dragonflies, birds, there's a whole uh, raft of new tools that are becoming available to allow one to really understand in microstructure the behavior of different animals. I, I will end just with a, a, a story about this. So one of the leading people in this realm is a person called Martin Wachowski of the Max Planck Institute in Constance. And uh, he was studying some vultures with these kind of tracking devices, some vultures that had been reintroduced into the French Alps back in 2015. Uh, and suddenly he and the team noticed that all of the vultures were going towards one particular spot in the French Alps. Um, and that turned out later in the day to be the spot where the uh, German wings uh, flight crashed. Um, so for, when I heard that story, I thought, you know, this is a, an interesting, this is a new moment in terms of our relationships with other species, where we now have new ways to benefit from the hive mind, not only of humans, but of other forms of life. Uh, and this, I think, raises a, a new interesting challenge for designers. Uh, how can we create uh, new ways uh, to have empathy with the species with whom we share the earth? Thank you very much. Should I sit or? <laughs> yep. Yep. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Paula, and uh, your entire team, and uh, the team and the board of the Triennale. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, of course, when I received this invitation, uh, I am not used to be in, uh, in proper design architecture circle because I think of myself of doing something else. But uh, it's very interesting to be forced to think through the concept of, uh, of the coming triennial. And uh, the more I was thinking about it, the more, the clearer it became to me that the practice that uh, i developing in Dakar in Senegal and the kind of projects that, that, uh, that we do at Raw Material Company are a form of design and uh, uh, a design practice that doesn't say its name as design and that doesn't present itself as design, but which is uh, very much part of uh, designing the social. So when you live in a territory where over 60% of the people are younger than 25, you can only have hope and you can only be hopeful and you can only be engaged in construct, uh, constructing 
that environment, and uh, and I uh, I came to realize that uh, artistic work and political work in the context that I work is a form of designing the social. So um, I think I have only one slide. So in case you're tired and this, uh, feel asleep after the nice risotto, you can just take a quick nap because there is not much film. I don't know how to use this. Okay, I'm an IT idiot also. So I think that what kind of relationship uh, exists between social design and the contemporary art center that does not deal with design? It's only one. There's only the first one, that's fine. And we can all also stay with this, that's okay. It's okay. So what kind of relationship exists between social design and the contemporary art center that does not deal with design per se? There is none apparently, but a connection might be deciphered from the lines below that I will explain to you. So in this presentation, I will take a few liberties of interpretation. The first is to state that from the start that this is a presentation of, it's a shy attempt to expand and reconstruct the notion of social design as it is understood so far. And according to Paula, the term is typically used to label the work of those designers and architects who focus on tasks born out of humanitarian and social political issues. But the term is deeply unsatisfying. For instance, it suggests that the type of design that is not conceived for the benefit of individuals, but rather for idealized and average groupings thereof with the intent of improving their conditions. So I would argue that if we investigate the term in regards to what distinguishes its established use from opinion, such as the one I'm about to propose here, social design has on the one hand more to do with immateriality than materiality. On the other hand, it also has to do with agency that can come in many forms. The format of the building or the object or is not the most important. Therefore, putting forward materiality completely occults the, real, re, the relational aspect of designing the social in the sense of constructing psychological spaces of historical and political references and eventually active engagement and participation. Another liberty I'm taking is to claim that contexts largely define everything and, uh, that we do. This happens often regardless. Oh, okay. So that's the only, this is a very exciting slideshow made of one slide. That's the studio of an, a very important artist that I will come to speak about later. So another liberty that I'm taking is, uh, is to claim that context, context defines largely everything that we do. This happens regardless, often regardless of the generally accepted knowledge and definition of whatever it is that we do. Such is the exercise here to inscribe forms of popular culture, political activism, and artistic and intellectual agency into the wider understanding of social design. Please, I just started. I'm not even there yet. This claim can be suitably observed in the language, such as French, which we use largely use in West Africa and in Senegal, where I come from, which is the official language. And French, as it has been appropriated in former French colonies in Africa, during the height of the trend to find and employ more respectful terms for less advantaged people in society, in France they came up with the term sans domicile fixe, which largely means without a fixed address, as opposed to speak of a clochard or a bum. The same term 
was quite immediately appropriated in many former French colonies in Africa to signify the wealthy and the affluent. Now you may ask yourself, how can a term that signifies the clochard, the bum, on the one hand, in another place, in another context, and signify the wealthy and the fluent in the other. And that is to count without counting with the creativity, which I call designing the social of many people in Africa. For SDF, which was the short term for sans domicile fixe in France, became immediately in our context sans difficulté financière. That means without financial difficulties. So this is to say that to be an SDF in Paris is very much different than to be an SDF in, uh, in Dakar, in Abidjan. So the association of the rich and affluent in econ economically poor context with a term that is understood to define underserved people is a social twist based on, a, based on change in a context. The appropriations by colonial languages by many Africans who turn them into localized systems of social representation is, in my point of view, one of the most effective manifestations of social and collective design. My claim is that design is an elastic term. It is a process whose multiple approaches provide an unlimited sphere of definitions and interpretations for the study of its role in society beyond the aesthetics and forms of objects and buildings that it may produce. Language, as an immaterial form of social construction, is a carrier of social transformation, as well as popular philosophies and points of views that consistently and effectively shape our perception and experience of society. This constitutes a form of mental design that is often overlooked when discussing social design. One can see this clearly in the endless phrases adorning mostly vehicles for local and long-distance transportations in countries like Nigeria or Cameroon, where Pidgin English, another language that, I mean, another language that usually is referred to as broken English, whereas it is an, uh, an appropriation of the English language that has been transformed and marinated through African culture to become something totally independent. So where Pidgin English is a binding language of communication among people of so many different linguistic backgrounds. If you imagine that Cameroon alone has something like 200 languages, or Nigeria, I don't even know how many, uh, colonial languages become vehicles of communications. So be it, be it with stickers or graphic paintings, and I purposely didn't bring many slides because I really want you to listen and have to build your own imagination. So be it with stickers or graphic paintings applied directly onto the vehicles, the phrases are meant to provide courage, solace, and most importantly, the will to continue to believe in life even in the face of difficulties. So if we believe that design is a form, a practice that is there to make our lives better, or at least to make us make our lives better. I think that these examples of uh, public philosophy to adornment uh, on cars in public transport is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. So what you have to imagine is that uh, for public transportation, you have all these buses, cars, and mini taxis, and so on. They are all adorned with lots of things. So, and particularly in Nigeria, there is a culture of uh, diffusing uh, wisdom through the society, like on a daily basis. So you don't need to go to the shrink, just sit in the bus and read these sentences, and you'll feel better. There are snippets of wisdom distilled in the air for free use and sort of open source laboratory for public therapy. 
So during a day of pursuing a livelihood for yourself and your family, reading a phrase such as, never despair, your miracle is around the corner. Pasted on a bus may seem trivial to some, but could provide comfort to others. It tells you to keep going on. Don't give up. Next time, it's your turn to be well. In a context of political camouflage and all sorts of corrupt dealings to keep or gain power, reading on a bus, no condition is permanent. Painted on a bus is or a cab, opens up spaces of possibilities in your mind. I tell you this story. In Cameroon, three former members of cabinet were notoriously corrupt and notoriously known for embezzling public money, erected three high-rise apartment buildings at the crossroad of an upper-class neighborhood in Douala. In a city where one does not navigate using street names or public squares, landmarks are essential for directions. And landmarks are created organically, kind of daily. It was not long before that spot where these three corrupt ministers erected their high rises from money they embezzled from the government. It was nicknamed or coined Le Carrefour des Trois Voleurs, the crossroad of the three thieves. So it became a recognizable reference for drivers, for cab drivers. No one knows really who came up with the name, but every local knows exactly today where that is. You say the crossroad of, of the three thieves, the cab driver will take you there. So language allows for discernment and provides underlying mechanism for the creation of these terms, ultimately designing a mental framework. In this particular case, even though the buildings are located at the crossings of two major streets carrying official names, hardly anyone cares about those names or even knows them. What is more relevant is the reference that people create and the revenge they take on people who govern them, who govern them badly, of course, by inscribing their wrongdoings into the urban landscape. So in Senegal, for instance, former President Ward appointed his son to head the strategic super ministry of state to oversee international cooperation, regional development, air transportation and infrastructure, huge ministry. So the son was at the same time the president's special advisor on economic affairs as well as head and also as also head of the agency in charge of the organization of the March 2008 summit of the organization of Islamic community held in Dakar. I really have to say this one. It is an open, it is a no, it is an open secret for a lot of people that such key positions are major schemes for massive embezzlement. It has become simpler for people to nickname the president's son Minister of Heaven and Earth, to pointedly express the power and control that he had over the society. Here again, no one knows who came first up with the, ter with the term. Nevertheless, it largely spread through all strata of society because it translated a general feeling of abuse of power and nepotism. Even after the Wad clan lost power in 2012, the term is commonly used to, used to this day to refer to Karim Wad. I have more to say, but I'm told to stop, but maybe we can continue on the, on the panel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you, Paola, Ala, Laura, and the Triennale team for the invitation. Let's see if uh, the slides work for me. Okay. Um, 
so I'm going to talk about uh, Dissident Gardens, that is a project we developed at the new institute, and as you will see, has a particular uh, focus in the Netherlands, although we think it talks about larger questions. Um, so we think that in, in the garden, our desire for control collides with our fascination for the unexpected. Gardens are architectures for the undomesticated, complex systems, we could say a preserved wildlife in partial confinement, spaces where planted species coexist with those arriving with seed dispersal, and where natural weather conditions are boosted by smart technologies. Fertile grounds of experimentation, gardens have been the site of discoveries and revolutions. The technical innovations that occurred in cooperation with the development of the garden, for example, allowed for the appropriation and reproduction of portions on nature and indigenous sources of knowledge in a global scale. Gardens are a result of global circulatory processes and regimes, but also have become necessary places for withdrawal and relaxation for large parts of the population, especially after the Industrial Revolution. The image of the silent, patient, and constant gardener promoted and aestheticized vision and version of labor. Gardens are spaces for reflection, but no less than sites of labor abuse and struggle. From the garden hermits hired to live on display in exchange of room and board, to the migrant workers laboring agricultural fields, to the non-human laborate uh, automated landscapes on today's greenhouse infrastructure. Gardens are political theaters where power is represented and enacted. Yet, as liminal spaces between interior and exterior, gardens are also spaces where new forms of resistance, new worlds are imagined and formed. The new institute program, Dissident Gardens, explored the unstable landscape of the present and the unpredictable territories of the future through the lens and the metaphor of the garden. The garden is seen as a space where global narratives and forms of production, labor, migration, and experimentation are continuously being contested and redefined. The exhibition gravitates around a series of projects. The one, the first is Garden in Mars. To imagine a garden in Mars is to reinvent the concept of ecology under other circumstances in which machinic perceptions and artificial creatures exist not to transplanted but unaltered terran organisms. Yet, in order to inhabit Mars, the red planet seems to have to be colonized according to the visions of companies and governments, to be recast as an image of the Earth, to be terraformed. Mars will be our ultimate garden in which are reflected all our aspirations, conflicts, and ideological struggles from the home planet. Mars is a mirror. The second is human insect. Architecture theorist Mark Wigley unearthed the far-reaching fusion of technology and the human being. Through the antenna architectures, from insects to the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, to our relation to technology and the phones that we carry all the time as portable antennas. The third part of the exhibition was called Global Flower. Western contemporary gardens are a result of the rise of global trade since the 17th and 18th centuries that allow for the discovery, documentation, and packaging of species that were brought back to the European market. Today, the spaces of flower actions, such as the ones that are in Almere in the Netherlands, uh, have more than 20, 40 million plants from all over the world, where, and they are priced and traded. The Netherlands, I don't know if you know, has four decades, for four decades been the largest flower exported in the world. Most of the flowers that we have have actually passed through the Netherlands, and I don't know if you know that your flowers probably have collected more uh, frequent flyer miles than uh, you will do. And finally, I'm going to talk a bit longer on the last part of the exhibition that is called Automated Landscapes, also known as Smart Farming. 
the architecture of full automation is currently being implemented across the Netherlands, from the country's main port in Rotterdam to the agricultural clusters. These transformations have an impact in the logic and relations that define the physical and social landscape and their future. The Dutch productive Cartesian landscape, designed for unprecedented efficiency, advances the imminent post-labor world and reveals the technology and architecture that will make it possible. It echoes our dreams and anxieties about what it is yet to come. Inside the greenhouses that occupy an enclosed vast part of the country, the productivity of the ground is controlled and maximized by automated technologies. In these interiors of sublime beauty, flowers and fruits grow assisted by climate control, artificial lighting, and water and nutrient distribution systems. They are unrestricted by exterior conditions, their imminent surroundings, and soon human labor. In the milk production centers, farmers direct the operations through the screens of their tablet or the computer and from mobile applications. Cows are assisted by robots and their performance is managed from the cloud. Animals and temporary workers become data and their bodies are managed as abstract components of larger systems. Meanwhile, the logistical infrastructure of the new fully automated APM container terminal in the port of Rotterdam, where self-driving vehicles, automated cranes, and diverse interfaces maximize the handling of containers with unprecedented performance and productivity, has triggered port workers' strikes and urban development projects that are transforming the social structure of the city. Traditional Port crane operators has been, this is our image of, of the different ways in which this enclosed the space and how people is able to or not to enter. So we'll, not human beings are almost in those, in those interiors. Only machines through different devices and technologies are filtered. Traditional port crane operators have been replaced by office workers seated in control rooms that oversee 24-7 operations. The container terminal office are an open field of flexible workstation, meeting rooms and lockers enclosed by a collection of concrete barricades, chain link fencing and CCTV cameras that prevent unauthorized access. Spaces and bodies are transformed. This Eden Gardens is a journey through these and other architectures in the Netherlands and beyond that look familiar, if rarely accessible or seemingly banal, but are nevertheless at the epicenter of transformation of labor and our environment. These enclosures are architectures at the service of an hegemonic order based on the exploitation and invisibility of its workforce and the technology that will make it possible. In bodies conceives as robots. Innovation, in many cases, is built at the expense of control and exploitation of the other. Enclosures that, on the other hand, echo those erected for the slave trade and labor, and where bodies were not considered human bodies, nor were considered humans. And it's precisely in that point that I would like to refer to the doors of no return and the work of Amal Allah. Uh, that participated in the exhibition, that are a symbol of the transatlantic slave trade, because it's precisely the space between the doors and the ocean where this is a site of engineered and racialized body, one that signs the violence that precipitated the forced movements of the slave and those still unfolding of the migrant and the refugee. Yet the doors, as Amal points, or rather the threshold between being and not being, it is also a site, a site for science fiction, a space for act of refusals, for radical imaginations, for the fight for a non-exploitative, non-discriminatory, non-racist world. So with this project, we wanted to launch a call for action. Despite the ongoing transformation, exploitation of the environment and bodies that inhabit it due to automated processes, 
This domain of research and innovation is still largely devoid of a critical spatial perspective. And our aim is to open up a discussion about this imminent future and the technologies that makes, and regimes that make it possible. And ultimately, to explore our agency to either embrace or challenge it. Although I think with the um, presentation this morning about the Shinto philosophy, maybe we have a nice path to follow. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so I'm going to start off with a few questions, and um, please uh, have yours uh, prepared, and we can turn to you in a few minutes. Um, so uh, I'm just going to kind of go in the order of, of, of your talks, and, and feel free to kind of interject in, in any of these topics. Um, but, but Michael John, I think one of the interesting things you talked about, um, so George Church's work to create a, an intervention, so to so use the latest in, in, in genetic technology, genetic engineering, um, to create an intervention designed to solve something that we recognize to be a complex system. Um, you know, and you, you, you remarked that uh, that as an intervention, given the complexity that we're talking about, won't necessarily solve that, right? This is, this is not a, a full contemplation of the full complex system that is extinction, nor does it necessarily fully contemplate the effect of bringing that intervention back into a landscape and considering what the effect of that intervention might be on the full system. And so I'm wondering this idea of how do we at once kind of continue to make progress on topics, on issues that require our interventions, um, sort of while at the same time keeping an eye toward the effect of that intervention in the broader complex landscape that we might sort of seed that back into. So how do we sort of balance, how do you think about balancing the need for advancement with at the same time the recognition that each of these individual solutions um, are discrete and nobody is necessarily thinking about them in, in, in a fully complex sense. Um, thanks. Well, in terms of George Church and bringing back mammoths, um, I think it's, it, I should say that uh, that project is a project which is looking at mammoths as sculptors of landscape. So it's not just a question of wouldn't it be nice to have a mammoth in the park uh, that we could, uh, uh, or in the zoo. Uh, it really is, it, it is looking at the question of large ruminants and, and their ability to shape landscapes, uh, which they did in the past in the, the steppes of Russia and elsewhere. So um, nonetheless, what, what I think is a little bit dangerous about the discussion of de-extinction is it's uh, something which people love in Silicon Valley, and it's uh, you know great. Okay, we, oh there is a problem with mass extinction, and uh, then um, but there are these people working on de-extinction, so maybe we don't have to worry about the other slightly less uh, visually appealing approaches to dealing with deforestation or uh, reinventing agriculture, which may actually be where. Uh, the more important and impactful interventions could happen. So uh, you know, I have nothing against George Church bringing back mammoths, but on the other hand, uh, some of the discussion around it uh, presents it, um, not, probably not by him, but more that what happens around it presents it as if this is a, a, a solution to, the ex to extinction, which it clearly isn't. Which, which actor in society do you think ought to maintain the sort of system's view of where we are collectively then making those interventions or making those investments or making those choices? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it's hard to pin it down on a single actor. Um, what I was uh, hinting at was, was uh, that um, we do have some extraordinary new tools now to look uh, collectively uh, at, um, and at, at various different scales at uh, the, the uh, natural environment. And whether it's through remote sensing projects or uh, through various uh, you know, uh, projects, which, which are these animal tra tracking, biologging, et cetera. And one of the, the interesting consequences of that is that um, where people had done studies of animal behavior in very weird, isolated, artificial environments before, now people are looking at huge scales and mass collective behavior and learning all sorts of unexpected things. Uh, and in a way, 
offering new opportunities for a, a new kind of cooperation with different species where we, we're actually benefiting. A little bit like if you think of falconry or using cormorants for fishing or uh, the, uh, the, honey, uh, the honey bird guide uh, and these kinds of human other species cooperations. Um, I think with a little bit of help from some technology, we now have a whole new realm of opportunity that is opening up around that. Um, Koyo, on a, on a very different uh, topic, you, you mentioned um, kind of context defining everything we do, you said. And so I'm curious if we, if we sort of introduce the idea of kind of umwelt into this, of, of the stuff that makes up the world that we can't detect at any given moment. Um, we know that there's plenty of that, right? At any given moment, an artist, a designer, a scientist is, is working with what she has observed and what context she has. Um, and then is, is presenting some externalization of that, some intervention. How do we, um, how, do, how do you think about kind of considering the completeness of that context, right? So not sort of only sensing that which you're capable of sensing, but almost acknowledging and communicating that umwelt, that part of our context that we, that is not visible to us, not visible to others. So how do we sort of really, to connect it to systems, we recognize that that context is a complex system at any given moment. How do we understand that? How do we communicate that? How do you think about that? Uh, that's the difficulty and the complexity of the whole thing. Sure. I think uh, there is no way of sort of grasping or even, in, you know, embracing or even, you know, kind of holding the, the any given context, even if you are from there and you, you know, live there and you practice there. Uh, I think what I was, uh, I was uh, presenting and what I sort of, you know, uh, uh, I'm concerned with is uh, to understand uh, certain territories of, as particular uh, and, uh, and, and defining those particularities in a sense that uh, have a, a kind of a productive, restorative, magical impact into, into any intervention and uh, that, uh, uh, that you can make in it. So uh, to, to narrow it down, uh, if you look at uh, most uh, West African territories, I mean, which is the region I, I know best, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a particular area, and uh, it's a particular territory with a particular history, and, uh, and has been uh, developing uh, over, I don't know, I don't, uh, I mean, life started there, so to speak, if I may say so, and, uh, and, and humanity started in, uh, in Africa. So if you, if you count all that, then all that knowledge that has been, you know, uh, developed and produced, and uh, the different influences that that knowledge and those civilizations, those cultures have been exposed to and, uh, and transformed by, uh, for the matter, uh, it becomes it becomes highly uh, complex in a sense of uh, how what to do with it, you know, in the in the in the present day. And this is why I think that the concept of designing the social uh, that I'm interested in is really also a matter of responding, you know, to an immediate uh, uh, environment through, uh, with tools that are available. And uh, most of West Africa is not industrialized, so you don't really have access to all these sexy, fancy kind of uh, tools that most people have in Euro-America and elsewhere. So the creativity that is imposed on you by sheer uh, reality of lack. 
so to speak, you know, makes it, makes it uh, 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 a challenge, but at the same time also motor and the drive, you know, to come up with not necessarily solutions, but to come up with uh, proposals that uh, contribute to, uh, to a better life, so to speak. Um, I want to push on something, but I want to ask Marina a question. If we have time, I'll come back. Um, so I think the, sort of what, what struck me about the idea of gardens in this conversation is that I almost interpret them as substrates for complexity to occur. Um, they are an act of, of actually creating a setting for complexity to occur, right? We're almost thinking what is the most fertile setting for complexity to occur and all the things that you were talking about that are playing out in a human sense, in a social sense, in a political sense on top of them. Um, I wonder if you can kind of play with that idea a little bit. How do you think about sort of the garden or even more broadly about the design of substrates for complexity to occur? What I find it interesting about the garden is that on the one hand we are um, yeah, fascinated by the possibility of that complexity, but we want to have that complexity under control. Yeah. So you are only allowing certain parameters to be unexpected. And uh, I think this kind of endless uh, fight for trying to have the perfect garden, um, but also being totally amazed by having new plants or new creatures uh, inhabiting it is, is what it is beautiful. Um, I, I really don't know what, what will be to create that, that really space, but what I'm interested in that is that the idea of garden seems to be very connected to a still human labor producing that space. And um, maybe I would be more interested in another uh, ground or a space in which, as we have been discussing the entire afternoon, the human is not at the center of that paradigm, of that space of creativity. Um, yeah, so especially in those uh, greenhouses that I was uh, showing, that's especially evident how, you know, it is totally uh, uh, trying to isolate the production of flowers and plants from the exterior conditions, try to control and not give any, uh, you know, space for the unexpected. And I think that is, uh, on the one hand, extremely exploitative, and on the other, yeah, I, I think is, is going uh, against the notion of, of the, the systems that govern the earth, you know, trying to not to be in symphony with other things that are happening. And do you see, do you see the act of design as, as seeding those initial conditions and sort of creating that substrate or defining parameters of that emergence, of allowing where that emergence unfolds until sort of what's the, what's the end, where do you stop the algorithm, where do you stop the complexity from sort of taking shape? Yeah, I would say that the act of design is always in that pe precarious space yep. between being in control or, and also being open to the unexpected. Uh, it's just a very romantic idea maybe, but I, I would say it's somehow there. But mm. taking it to, the, to different scales maybe is a form of governance. Mm that could be interesting also for institutions or for more uh, larger uh, governing bodies. Um, questions from, from the audience? Paola. Um, it's uh, very hard to, complex, uh, to grasp complexity, right? So this is for you, Adam, actually. Do you foresee a day in which there's going to be a special program in the computer where people plug in some choices they might make and just see what possible consequences, systemic consequences their choices might be, however, however banal, like taking the train versus taking the flight. Uh, do you ever see that as a possibility? I hope so. Um, you know, I think the, the, uh, the need for systems thinking goes beyond institutions. I think having that capacity or scientists having that capacity but extends to all of society having that capacity. And so, um, you know, I think there's a role for technology certainly as much as there's a role for art and philosophy and design and other forms of, sort of social change to compel that. I do think that the data and technology and information architecture and sort of how we access information and how we, we make choices in the world um, is grounds for 
trying to take on some of the need for systems thinking in the world. So um, I hope so. Uh, and I do think that that's a possibility, and I do think that we have the, uh, the conditions in place and sort of the raw materials in place uh, to take on such a sort of challenge. But it, may I yeah, ask yeah. that just on that? Um, yeah. If you're dealing with nonlinear systems, yeah. um, um, surely uh, even if you plug in a set of initial parameters to some, something like that in terms of, I don't know, your commuting habits or whatever it might be, right. um, you know, the outcomes will be subject to, even if there's a small perturbation or you don't have the complete data, then it's, it's complexity, so, so you might have very different outcomes. Yep. Or... Yeah, so um, I think what, 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 you know, what this suggests is that, um, and this is actually what I was going to ask you, is sort of where do, we, where do we think about the boundaries of context, or where do we think about the boundaries of that complexity? What, what needs to be included in any of those models? Um, in order for us to arrive at a you know, reasonable accuracy. And that, that makes it very challenging. So if, you're, if you think about how um, we organize things today, how we talk about things today, um, we wouldn't necessarily allow for all of the factors, all the parameters that might give rise to precisely what you're talking about uh, to intersect. Um, we, we, we don't see the full context. And actually, that's the challenge, is how do we actually uh, inspect the broader context, model the broader context, um, that's apparent at any given moment uh, so that we can get a more accurate systemic portrayal of an outcome. I'm pressed to ask the question back to you, Paula. I mean, what do you think a device would contribute into influencing our choices with knowledge that we already have? You know, in terms of, I mean, if you take your precise example, train versus flight, I mean, do you need the device actually to know that the, or the one or the other, I mean, the, the, the impact of the one or the other on, 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 uh, on, on nature? So uh, I, I, I wonder, of course, it will be more interesting, it will be maybe more tangible, maybe it will be, you know, more visual or more uh, applied, so to speak. I see uh, this device, yeah. I see this device more as a guide, not as, some, uh, not as something that gives you data and tells you this is what you must do. It's almost like the I Ching, you know, that's how I see it. So I don't see it as um, uh, somebody giving you the carbon footprint versus the water footprint, but rather something that gives you some, some of the variable, at least, a, at least a list of like 25 variables that you might have never thought about um, that might deal you know, with you transporting pollen. I don't know, it's just something that I hadn't thought of, but yeah. um, Adam in his new office has this wall where he asks people to write three objects that might be completely disparate but instead are connected in a complex system. Ala has done her thesis on the connection between jellyfish and migrations. Mm. Um, so there are sometimes these discoveries that leave you completely puzzled. So that's how I see it, not think, as a, uh, yeah. Huh? I, there's a philosopher in Munich actually called Andreas von Müller, and he, or, sorry, Albrecht von Müller, and he, he, he has a project which is a little bit uh, akin to that. The whole, the whole goal is to create empathy with your future self. Um, so um, as a way to look at kind of how do you create behavior change around, for example, health or, or food or these kinds of questions, uh, to actually confront yourself with your, your future self if you make particular decisions and if you, uh, and then actually how can we create that sense that uh, this challenge of, of creating a sense of long-term thinking uh, uh, and uh, for people to grasp these abstract concepts. So almost that face-to-face uh, -face contact with, with yourself 20 years from now, 30 years from now, having gone down a particular thought, and how can one create that conversation? Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking, I mean, maybe, uh, I don't rely on technology for that, I would say. I mean, I, I kind of agree with you. In, um, I think it's a question, first, of education, but not necessarily through an application, because it will always be measured as an optimization. So how much I can do in order not to do? It seems like the agreements that uh, they, the, the governments do for climate change are always like 
minimums. And I think what is needed is to think about other terms that are maybe not other definitions of success, other definitions of opportunities, other definitions of uh, engagement, other definitions of, of how to live together that is not based on exploitative practices rather than, um, and I don't think that throughout device or an algorithm that will be that evident. I think it's a restructuring of the, the ways in which we imagine our, our relation to, to others and our own lives. And I think in order to do that is something much more deep that maybe is assessing the, your position in the planet and in the community and trying to understand how maybe your success is the uh, you know, failure of another or the exploitation of the other. So I would be more maybe humanistic approach in, in this sense rather than uh, relying on, on uh, any device. That's a question. No, this, are oh, you, okay. Oh, wait, I don't have, I'll give you my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Performance <laughs> art enters the scene. Um, yesterday at our um, session of the advisory board, thank you so much. No, no problem. Um, the advisory board, we talked, there was a bit of discussion about the transfer of scientific metaphors to cultural and social situations and vice versa, um, and how powerful actually some of the inherited concepts from older, older ways of scientific, ways, ways of seeing the world, so Newtonian physics, for example, um, or uh, early understandings of, um, Darwinian evolution and how we project that onto our social and cultural systems. Um, I wondered if there was anything that we could share from this knowledge of science of understanding complexity that might be a science useful, and understanding complexity. useful new uh, way of um, seeing our social and cultural challenges like as scientific metaphors that we might use as tools for better reimagining our individual and collective positions in the world. That's for you, I think. That's for me. <laughs> um, I mean, I would say that uh, we've seen in the last, I don't know, call it decade, um, the rise of, uh, of genetic metaphors, right, in society, for example, with the rise of, simply the rise of genetics. Um, so we talk about you know, the DNA of an organization as, as a simple example. Um, and I think there's a, there's a, a usefulness, there's a utility to um, bringing uh, scientific concepts if you can sort of see them as, as encapsulating a philosophy, a methodology, something nested in that, in that term, um, in that language, uh, it, it is quite useful for advancing sort of the literacy in society for those particular types of concepts, right? And abstracting them and using them in new combinatorics and so forth. And so I think um, uh, I, I would certainly venture to, to bet that in the coming five to 10 years, um, the language of networks and, and complex systems um, will too enter the broader public lexicon um, and with a utility for compelling us in a room full of uh, designers and architects, for example, uh, to use certain key concepts from complex systems and from networks to sort of advance that thesis. So uh, there's a precedent for it. Um, there's a challenge, I think, that you're also raising, which is that sometimes those concepts, uh, you know, become calcified uh, in a particular community or techniques become calcified whereas the science itself that preceded it or that gave rise to it has been moving forward. So we think about, we talked yesterday about taxonomies and ways of organizing information. Uh, and so in the context of a dynamic, complex, adaptive system, um, the way that you might organize information and talk about um, uh, hierarchies or parents and children or sort of those kinds of concepts um, may no, no longer be sort of the best possible information architectures for an age of complexity. So I think there's a trade-off that we, we need to be mindful of while we introduce that lexicon. Just to add to that, maybe, uh, um, I think you, you talked about taxonomy and, and so on, which was very much our sort of dominant way of 
uh, interpreting the natural world and, and de you know, going right through to current DNA barcoding yep. projects and so on. Yep. But perhaps what's much more interesting is what uh, Richard Dawkins called the, the extended phenotype. You know, the, the phenotype being the way the genome is expressed uh, in the organism and the extended phenotype being the whole repertoire of activities collectively and individually that the organism has. And, and I think uh, it would be interesting to think of how that can, can feed into our ways of uh, the dominant metaphors we use for the world. Yeah. One final question, if there is one. One minute. Is that a hand or not a hand? Not a hand. Um, then perfect, we will leave it one minute early. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, great panel. So you have a, a 15 minute break and we'll be back here at 4.30 with our final break, with our final section about long-term attitudes. Thank you, that was great.